Today I'm going to speak on a message that's uh, kind of a one-off deal here, just to help you understand some of the core values of our church, and really as a reminder to our church body, why we do what we do, because, because our values affect um, what we do as a church, decisions we make, uh, choice of sermons, how we design services, everything else is designed around these four critical values. I read a phrase years ago that really impacted me. It said um, that you really don't know what to live for until you know what you'll die for. And when I thought about that, I said, that's really profound because I had to ask myself, what are the things that I would say are, are most core to who I am? What are the things that I would say, I'm never going to let go of this? I'm never going to surrender this thing. I would die for this thing. And once you determine those things, you can kind of backtrack to where you are today and say, okay, if that's true, then this ought to be priority in my life. This is how I should live because this is really what matters most. And all of us have whether we've ever written down or whether we've ever really thought of them as core values, but we live by them. You know, your core value might be your standard of living. Like, I want to make sure that I always can live comfortably, have the security of knowing that I have enough in the resources in the bank to make sure that I'm not going to get in a position where I have to fear. That may be a core value to you. So you work hard. You work extra jobs. You save a ton. You, you live in the house you live in, or you, you eat the food you eat. You wear the clothes you do because you said, that's, that's important to me. I don't want to be poor. I grew up poor. I don't want to be poor anymore. That's a, that's a core value. Maybe for you, your core value is, is your sports team. Like, I am devoted to the whatever, you know, basketball, football, baseball team. And so you've got jerseys, you've got a room decorated, you organize your time around them when the game is on, you talk about it to your friends and family, so you can just tell by the way you live, that is kind of a, a non-negotiable for you. In fact, you'll even get rude if people try to, try to impose on your game time. You'll change services you go to because of that team. Um, health and appearance can be a, a core value. And so, you know, the, the money you invest in the gym, uh, making sure that you're, you eat the right food, um, plastic surgery, hair coloring, whatever it is you need to, to make sure that you always look young and youthful and feel that way, um, it, it just shapes the decisions you make. It shapes how you, how you spend your time, how you spend money, what you value the most. But I want to challenge you that at the, at the core of your being, that the values you choose are the things that not only make you a better person, they make everybody around you better. In other words, you become a blessing to the people around you because you value these certain things. And now there are values like that. For example, the value of character. Like if I wanna be a person of integrity. I can, just, I can just tell you that if that is a core value, and that is something you say, I'm not gonna negotiate, I'm not gonna compromise, I'm gonna be a person of integrity. When my taxes are due, I'm gonna be honest about it. When people ask me the uh, question, I'm gonna tell them the straight truth. I'm gonna be a person of integrity. You will, you will bless your family, whether you're husband or wife. You, you will bless your employer. You will, you will bless the people that are around you because they know that you're someone that can be counted on because you're a person of high integrity. Well, there are a lot of things you could choose as core values, and I'm gonna share with you today four values that that we share as a church. And because of this truth, that what's most important is what's most impactful. And what, what we value as, as most important as a church will have the greatest impact as we try to live out our faith in the world. We call these kind of behind the doors as the four L's because each one of them has a, as, as a critical word in it that starts with the letter L. So let's just get started here with the first one. And this is in the order of importance in the sense that this one has to be first, the Lordship of Christ. The Lordship of Christ. This says something about not only who I view Jesus to be, but my commitment to him. Now, there are a lot of terms that you could give to Jesus. But when you say that he's Lord, you are not only saying something very lofty about him, but you're saying something very significant about your relationship with him. And it is at the core of who we are as Christians. You read through the New Testament, you will find a lot of titles given to Jesus. He's the Messiah, he's the Son of Man, uh, he's Savior. Uh, but, the, but the most dominant, without a doubt, by, by a factor of many, many, many. For example, in the book of Ephesians, Paul called Jesus Lord 23 times. I mean, it is, it is the go-to word when you describe your relationship with Jesus. He's my Lord because it speaks of his authority. Last week we celebrated Easter. Well, there was an after effect of Easter. And Paul writes about it in Philippians chapter 2. Now, in, in that passage, we're just going to take the last part of this, this old ancient hymn that says, 
Jesus, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is who? Lord to the glory of God the Father. That is the name God bestowed on Jesus, the name above every other name, that he is Lord meaning he is an ultimate authority. Lord speaks of someone who I owe everything to, the one I should serve, the one I owe allegiance to. Jesus isn't just Savior. He's not just a friend. He is Lord. He is the authority because God has given him that title because of what he did on the cross. He died for our sins, rose from the dead, and now he's Lord. In the 1500s, there was a scientist named Nicholas Copernicus who had a revolutionary theory. He said that the reason we see ships kind of fall off the face of the earth is because the earth is round and the earth rotates around the sun. Now, people thought he was a heretic. They thought he was crazy because everyone knows when you look up, the sun moves around the earth and the moon follows it. And as kids, you grow up and you say the sun rose and the sun set. But in reality, we all know now that's not true. The earth has been moving, not the sun. See, Copernicus came up with what's called a heliocentric universe. That means the sun is at the center and everything else revolves around the sun. And there's an incredible spiritual connection here. Because at birth, you grow up and, and when you cry, mommy and daddy respond to you. And, and, and when you want something, other people spring into action. We grow up thinking we are the center of the world. And everything revolves around us. What I like, what I don't like, what I want, what I don't want. Everything revolves around me. And so we grow up with that attitude. You may not not come right out and say it, but you function like that. Like, well, I don't like that. Or I like this. And I don't want that. And I'm going to do this and not that. And we rebel and we fight because we want everything to cater to us. Now, fortunately, we don't see that in the church. Everyone's happy with everything the church does because we're, no, because we're human. I like certain kinds of music. I like certain styles of preaching. I like certain kinds of clothing. I have certain expectations. That's why I like it. And everything ought to revolve around me because that's the way it ought to be. But God comes along and says, "Uh uh-uh, no way. It It all revolves around the Son, Jesus Christ. Do you know the Bible says this about Jesus, that everything was made by him and for him? It wasn't made for you. It wasn't made for me. I get to enjoy it. God, God gave us this planet to enjoy, but he didn't say, hey, uh, this is all for you, and now it's all about you. No, Jesus says, no, it's still all about me. In fact, you're about me. You, the reason you exist is not for you. The reason I exist is not for you. You exist for me. You exist to bring glory to me. And that is such a revolutionary truth to, to wrap your, your head around, to realize that my life revolves around Jesus? See, here's the, here's the view we often have. My life is like a pizza or a, or a, or a pie. I've got, I've got slices. And so I've got, I've got family and I've got work and I've got hobbies and I have finances and I have personal health and all these things. You know, you've got, you got a number of different slices to the pie and one of those slices we say is religion or my relationship with God. He's one of the many slices of the pie. Now, the the fallacy about that is God does not want to be relegated to a slice of life. He wants to be at the core. A better picture is not a pie, but a wheel. Because in a wheel, the very center of that wheel is a hub. And from that hub go spokes. And and we can look at our life with the spokes of family and work and hobbies and finances and health and all these things as spokes But at the center of it all is the Lord because he affects every spoke. And every spoke is related to him. In fact, the strength of the wheel all is in the connection to the hub. Now, it's interesting. I I, I, I intended to go into my shed and grab a tire off of one of my bicycles, and I forgot to. So I went downstairs, and I said, Surely, Lord, there's a wheel down here somewhere. I'm scrounging around before this service downstairs, thinking, Come on, Lord, there's got to be a wheel that you've got for me down there. So last, last aisle I look, and there's a wheel. I said, All right, Lord. And I, I pick up this wheel. Look at it. Oh. 
Now, for some of you, that's your life. You don't have a hub. Jesus isn't the hub. And, and would you want to ride this? No way. You couldn't anyway because there's no hub. <laughs> but really, there's, this thing's going to break. It already has broken some spokes off because there's no hub to hold it together. Jesus has to be at the core. And that's why we confidently say, Jesus, you are Lord. See, in, in Matthew 28, after Jesus rose from the dead, he told his disciples, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Not some authority, all authority. Now, authority demands we adjust our lives to it. See, think about this. If you're driving down the highway and you find people zipping in and out and speeding and all that, you notice how quickly things change when a squad car shows up? Then you have to, no light on, it's not flashing, it's just, he's just like driving by. You get nervous. You start, oh, what's the first thing you do when you see a police car? Come on. You look at your speedometer, right? I'm not alone because, you know, I tend to speed. I better not be right now because I don't want to get a ticket. When I was a kid, you know, you rough house, you, you, get, you get wild in the house, and then dad's home. And so you, you, you shape up, you, you get an order, clean things up, because, you know, when the authority is present, life should be a certain way. <laughs> Same thing with Jesus. If he is Lord, our life should look a certain way. Now, when someone becomes a Christian, we ask them this question. And you see it every time someone's baptized. Do you believe Jesus Christ died for your sins and do you confess him as Savior and Lord? Because in the Bible, in Romans chapter um, 10, verse 9, it says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is who? Lord. Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Believe in your heart God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. You confess him as Lord. Lord, as the boss, as the king, the ruler of my life. You know when the early disciples followed Jesus? They didn't follow him because he was savior. He hadn't done anything to save him yet. You know why they followed Jesus? It was simply because he said, let's go. And they left fishing boats. They left their tax business. They just left everything behind to follow Jesus because of this one truth. This guy commands authority. And I ought to live my life in a way that honors and pleases him. And see, I don't think we understand the, the, the cost that, that can come because of calling Jesus Lord. If you happen to see the movie, um, Paul, the Apostle of Christ, it's very vivid in that movie that the early believers lived under the threat that you're going to get killed because you, you confess Jesus as Lord. See, the, the Roman emperors, and this, is, this has been found in archaeological evidence in ancient papyri manuscripts, that they used terms of themselves not only as political leaders but spiritual leaders. They used terms that, like this. They were Lord. They were God. They were Savior. And people actually had to, had to confess Caesar as Lord and offer incense as an offering to him. And, and this posed a dilemma for the Christians because a Christian would say, like, I can't do that because there's only one Lord. Lord means the one in authority, and the one in authority isn't Caesar. It's Jesus. And there was a, a, a Christian in the second century named Polycarp. He was an elder of a church in a town called Smyrna, and he would not make that confession and two leading city officials came to him and said, come on, all you have to do is say Caesar is Lord. You don't even have to really believe it. Just offer a little incense to him. It'll all be done. You can go on living your life as a Christian. He said, I can't do that. I can't do that. And they tied him to a stake. And you can see this in the movie of the Apostle Paul. Christians were burned like torches as a public display of what will happen if your loyalty is not to Caesar but is to Jesus. And as the flames began to rise around his body, he's reported to have said this, 86 years I have been Christ's slave and he has never done me no wrong. Or no, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme the king who saved me? And you may think, man, I'm glad I don't live back then. When, when people were burned for their faith, when people were thrown to the lions because they wouldn't confess Caesar as Lord. But do you know that was three years ago, just a couple months ago? when 21 Coptic Christians were led out to the beach and in orange jumpsuits were forced to kneel and Islamic terrorists beheaded them because they confessed Christ as Lord? Let me just ask you, if that was you, could you, would you confess Jesus as Lord? That's hard. It's really hard. And so if it's hard then, why not do it when it's easy? Why not confess Jesus repeatedly while it's easy? 
Because there could come a time when it's going to get really hard, really hard, and it could cost you your life. Jesus is Lord. It's at the core of who we are. It's more than a confession. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21, that everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. It's all about obeying him. If he truly is Lord, you'll do what he says. That's why every Sunday, like Sam said, we want to hear God's voice, do what he says, because that's evidence that he is Lord. The second L really ties into this statement there, because the second L is living the word. If, you're, if Jesus is truly Lord, then you want to know what he wants you to do, and then you'll do what he says. And we find out what God wants us to do in this book called the Bible, or the word of God. Uh, about 20 years ago, a leading Christian organization surveyed people to find out what had helped them grow in their faith. From the time of being a pre-believer to a, a new believer, from a new believer to a growing believer, from a growing believer to a, um, a very committed believer, and they found one common element. And the common element was this, the importance of understanding and applying God's word to their life. Friends, there's nothing that'll help you grow more in your relationship with God than getting to know and obey God's word. In scripture, uh, it, it's called our spiritual food. Remember Jesus when he was in the wilderness being tempted? In Matthew 4, Jesus quotes an Old Testament passage as he's responding to the devil because the devil said, turn these stones into bread. And Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. In other words, my real food is spiritual, and it's right here. It's in God's word. God's word is food. And so I want to share with you, because of that, three approaches to God's word. And really the first one comes out of that verse. Learn it. If it is spiritual food, then learn it. And it doesn't usually start with an eagerness to learn because as I said last week, the Bible often can be very overwhelming and intimidating. And so much so that we just say, I, I can't get into it. I'm just going to let the preacher tell me what to believe. I'm going to listen to that guy on the radio because he does all the hard work. But you're missing out on something. You're really missing out on what God is wanting to do in you. He wants to speak to you directly. When I was 16 and I became a Christian, I began to attend a Bible study with some other friends from my high school youth group. And there were times where I read the Bible and I go, oh, I don't even understand what that means but there are many other times where I read and I go, I know exactly what that means. And over the years, that, that understanding of God's word has increased year by year. In fact, that's why I went to Bible college. It wasn't to be a pastor. I had no desire to be a pastor. I just wanted to learn the Bible. And while I was there learning the Bible, God prompted me to give my life full time to, to ministry. But I have to say, even today, it is a passion that drives me. I want to know this book and there's a lot, a lot I still don't know about this book, but I still want to get into it. I want to know it. I want to, to, to fall in love with it. David had written many of the Psalms, and his longest was Psalm 119. Psalm 119 has 176 verses. Almost in the middle of it, verse 97, is this verse from David. Oh, how I love your law. It is, the, it is my meditation all the day. He had grown to a place where he says, man, I love this. It's like honey. It's like honey to, to my taste buds. It, 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 is, it is desirable. It didn't, doesn't always start that way, but it, I'll tell you, it grows to become like that. It, be, it becomes something that sustains you. It's like a life lifeblood going through you. Jesus said, if my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it'll be given you. My words need to, to abide in you, keep flowing into you. And so we want to love God's word. But you know what's so amazing about David is he said that when he only had the Old Testament. And most of us will say, well, I, I love the Bible. I really love the Gospels. And I love Paul's letters. And I love 1 Corinthians. And I love James and Philippians. And well, David didn't even have that. He just had the Old Testament. He said, even just that, I love it. Now, what really helped me as a young Christian was I got a hold of a Bible that spoke in a language I could understand. See, I'd gotten a Bible when I was a kid. It was the Revised Standard Version. And it was a huge Bible. I mean, it was like this big. And I opened it up. And I go, oh, man. I, I, can't, I can't read it. I, don't, I, I need like a comic book. That's what I need. That's, that was my reading capabilities back then. But as I got older, I said, I really want to read the Bible and understand it. But that, that's still a little hard. King James is very difficult. I, I can't really get into that. And a new version had come out called the New International Version. And I asked my parents if they would get me, a, get me a Bible for Christmas, and they did. And for the next, gee, 30 years, 
I studied the New International Version of the Bible because it spoke a language I could easily understand. And some of you know that a few months ago I, I made a commitment that I'm, gonna, I'm switching versions now to the English Standard Version. It's a little more accurate to the, to the original documents. It's, it's a little bit more difficult to read in some parts. But here's the key. Um, you need a version that, that, that really you will read. That's the key. What version is best for you? It's the one you'll read. Because having a, having a tough version or an easy version does no good if you won't read it. So get a version you will read. And a good way to find a version for you is to open up a Bible app or go on your computer to like Bible Gateway and look at different versions. You can just pick on us. Uh, they'll give you a menu of different versions. You know, try the different ones. Uh, I encourage you. Uh, if ESV, English Standard Version, is something that you like, then you'll hear that every Sunday because that's what I'm reading my verses from, the English Standard Version. So you want to get in God's word. Learn it, love it, and then live it. Live it. James chapter 1, verses 22 to 24 says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. What he's saying is the Bible shows you what you should look like. And when it points out your flaws, you're a fool to say, like, I'm not going to fix that. I'm not going to get the broccoli out of my teeth or or wet the colic in my hair. I'm not going to correct the thing that's out of place. He says, then why would you even bother to read it? This is to show you how to live. And the reality is, when it shows you how to live, it will correct faulty behaviors. Now, that's where the rub comes in. Because if Jesus isn't Lord, you'll, you'll push against it. You'll fight against it. Like, I don't want to hear that. I don't want you to tell me what to do. I don't want you to tell me how to live my life regarding sexual matters. Uh, I don't want you to tell me how to live regarding my attitude and how I talk to people. Well, then he's not Lord, is he? You know, I, I was told, and nobody came directly to me, but some, some people on our staff and in the church said, hey, I had a few friends that didn't like the, the series on finances or thought we talked too much about, about money. And yet last Sunday, I had a lady catch me in the foyer, and she said to me, She said, Pastor, I want to thank you so much for doing that series on finances. I really need to know what the Bible said about some of these areas, and and I've made some changes in what I'm doing, and it feels so good. And I said, now there's someone who wants Jesus to be Lord of that area of her life. Because when you want Jesus to to be Lord, you invite him in. You you invite him in to correct your your behaviors regarding your marriage that are out out of whack. You don't push against it. You say, no, I, Lord, I want to conform to you because you are Lord. So he's Lord. We, if he's Lord, then we live according to his word. And then it really flows into the next one, loving relationships. Loving relationships. Oh, actually, I got to back up and tell you something that's really, really interesting. There is a TV show that's out. It's a comedy called Living Biblically. And when I first heard that, I went, oh, great, another, another Hollywood bash against Christians because really, the, book, the, the, movie, uh, the TV show is based on a book that came out a few years ago, The Year of Living Biblically. A guy named A.J. Jacobs devoted a year of his life to trying to obey the things he read in Scripture. Now, now the, the awkward part of it is there are some things that are written that are very cultural. Dietary things and, and other such that, that we don't follow today. They don't even make sense in our culture. And yet he says, I'm going to do everything that the Bible says. So, um, so there's going to be some really weird things happening. But in the midst of that, Some really beautiful things happened. And as I watched the first episode of that show, and I was surprised because the very beginning, there's a a guy, the character, the lead character in the show, his name is Chip Curry. He says in the introduction, I'm committed to living my life 100% according to the Bible. And then he says this, I'm becoming a better person one verse at a time. And I watched that first episode, and there were some things that were kind of weird, but you know what? The, the main struggle of that episode was he, he felt like God's telling me to love my enemies. And the people around him was telling him, no, you don't. You know, they, they treated you mean. You don't need to love them. He goes, no, no, uh, the Bible says I should love my enemies, so I really, I really need to do that. I really need to love the people that are difficult for me. That's what happens when you try to live biblically. So now that, that ties into the next one, loving relationships, because... When you live biblically, you will find yourself becoming more loving. It's, it's inevitable. The closer you get to God, the deeper you go in your faith, the wider your stretch of love. You will find yourself loving people that were very unlovable in your past. I love how missionary Hudson Taylor calls the Christian life the exchanged life, meaning God takes my life 
and removes it and in its place puts his life. And when Jesus lives inside of us, he begins to love other people or continue his ministry through us. And because Jesus loved all kinds of people, he says, I want to love people through you now. And the, the struggle we have is, well, I don't, I don't love that person. <laughs> I really don't like that person. And I don't have the wherewithal to love this person, so how can I do it? And Jesus says, that's why I'm living inside of you. That's why the number one fruit of the Spirit is love, because love comes from God and fills us. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love comes where? It's from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Friday night, my wife and I saw the movie I Can Only Imagine. I've been waiting for weeks to see this. Oh, it's a powerful movie. You know that movie came out? They estimated it would gross. You know, it cost $7 million to make. They thought maybe they could make $7, $10 million. It's already surpassed $50 million. And, and it, it, is, it is one of the greatest movies of the year, honestly. And it resonates with Christians and non-Christians because it deals with this whole issue of love. And the man who wrote the song, I Can Only Imagine, opens up about the story that drove the lyrics of that song. It was his own relationship with his father. Now, I'm not going to tell you all the details about the movie, but I encourage you to go see it and bring a Kleenex. Because as I watched the movie, some things resurfaced for me. Some of you have heard bits of it before, but my dad was a very violent man. And, and us as kids grew up very afraid of our dad. We would, we would actually run when he came home to hide in the house. Like, we don't want to see dad because we never know when he's going to explode and, and then uh, just start yelling and throwing things around. And so we just didn't like the way our dad talked and how he acted. Sometimes he made us do ridiculous things. There was one time where my dad came home at night, like 6 o'clock in the winter. It was cold. It was dark. And it had rained through the day. Trees had fall, uh, leaves had fallen from the tree into his fishing boat. And he demanded that I go out there and mop out his fishing boat. And just things like that, like, like what made me kind of curse my dad. I admit, when I was a kid, I wanted to kill my dad. And I become a Christian. And I have all this love for people at my church and, and all this love for people who are lovable. And then God begins to prod me to love my dad. And I said, God, I can't. I, I don't know how to love my dad. He's not worthy of love. And God reminded me that he loved my dad as much as he loved me. That Jesus died for my dad just like he died for me. And that I didn't have to love my dad on my own, that he would love him through me. And I remember a time where I just felt really convicted that, you know what, I, I need to do something I've never done. Here I am, I'm, I'm 20 years old, returning to college, uh, Nebraska Christian College, which was like 500 miles away from my home. I'm getting ready to make the long drive, and I knew in my heart I need to tell my dad I love him. And uh, the, that day came. And, and mom went off to work, gave her a hug, loved her. Mom's easy to love. And then it was, there was my dad. And I loaded all the stuff up in my car. And I said, I, I can't do this. I said, Dad, I got to go now. Okay, bye. Went out, got in the car. And then I sat down. And I said, oh, God, I gotta, I've got to go back in. Because if something would happen and he would die, I couldn't live with myself. So I go back in the house, and he said, oh, what's wrong? You forgot something? I said, yeah, i got to use the bathroom. So <laughs> I didn't. So I go back there, make some noise, stew around, say, how am I going to do this? How am I going to say this? This is so hard. I come out, and I, I go over to my dad, and um, I'm just fumbling around with stuff. And, and I said, okay, Dad, I'm, um, I think I'm going to hit the road now. And the neighbor stopped and looked at him, and he says, just wanted you to know I love you. And then he said, oh, I love you too. And I went out in the car, and you know what? That started the kind of the floodgates of God filling my heart to where I could let go of all the hurt, all the anger, all the bitterness, all the feelings I had about him and see my dad more as a broken person who, who needed love. And so it's amazing what God does when he comes into your heart and you start to see it immediately with the people closest to you. It happens in your family, with your spouse, with your kids, or with your parents. But then it, then it expands. You find, man, I've got love for these strangers I meet at church. They're kind of like my family. You know, I come in, we hug each other, and, you know, you get really close to your church family. And, and then you start getting this love for people in this wider circle. See, this circle keeps getting bigger. All of a sudden, Lord, I, I care about people who are hurting. I care about victims 
I care about broken people. I, Lord, I care about the lost people in the world. And then you make a really big circle and you begin to love people who are your enemies. People who criticize you. People who abuse you. People who take advantage of you. People who persecute you. And in the midst of all that garbage, you say, I still love you. See, here's what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5. You've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Jesus says in that passage, you know, if you love the people who love you, pagans do that. The real mark that you belong to me is this, you love the most difficult people. And see, we struggle with that because we don't have the resources, but, but don't fear. God says, you don't have to have the resources. I am the resource. When I live in you, I will fill you with love. Anyone born of God will experience that. And if, you don't, if you're not experiencing this wider embrace of love in your life for people that are different from you, that are difficult and all that, then, then you must not be getting close to God because it's just a, an essential corollary to a walk with him. And it's really what matters most. In our next-gen department, we have a phrase that we've grabbed onto. It is fight for the relationship. We know all about fighting in the relationship, but I'm saying fight for the relationship. Don't let go. Fight for it with the help of the Lord. Because what, what lasts, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 13, he says this, now there's faith and there's hope and there's love, but you know what's gonna last forever? Love it is the greatest of these. So loving relationships is a core value that we hold to. And then the fourth one, it's a legacy of service. One of the things I love about living in Colorado Springs is the number of people who've made an impact on the city and who are remembered in the names of the streets, in libraries, in schools, uh, in buildings. You know, all, all sorts of places carry the names of people like, like Stratton and Palmer and Milton Proby and Nicholas Vinatucci, people who gave back to this community. And they're known because they served the people around us. They made this a better place because of what they gave. And, and Jesus said that, that, that the way we demonstrate love to other people is through service. We aren't saved um, from, from this world in the sense of our goal is survival. Let's just survive the world so we can get to heaven. Let's just endure it, tolerate it, put up with it, and then get to heaven. It's not surviving in the world. We're left here to serve the world. We're left here to be a, a tangible expression of the love of Christ in this world. Listen to, to Jesus. This is, again, back to Philippians chapter 2, that passage about Jesus and being called Lord. Earlier it says this, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. A servant. Jesus even told his disciples in, in uh, Matthew 23, 11, the greatest among you shall be your servant. Serving demonstrates the love of Christ within us. You know, I've come to evaluate every restaurant according to the Chick-fil-A standard. Because when I go to Chick-fil-A, they're always happy, and they're always helpful at the counter, and they're always eager to bring the food out to the table. In fact, they actually come around to the table later and say, can I, can I get anything for you? Can I refill your drink? Can I take your tray of trash? And they'll go, um, you know, throw it away for us. And, and after every encounter, and, and I say, like, oh, thank you very much, they always say the same thing, my pleasure. And actually, they look like they're having fun doing it. They actually, it's not like force, like, my pleasure. They, they made me say that. No, it's really like, yeah, I'm here to serve you. So when I go to another restaurant, I go, man, they do better at Chick-fil-A than this place. <laughs> that, that burger place needs to send their people to the Chick-fil-A training. I've never heard anybody say my pleasure at that place. And see, it is a, it is a joy to serve. It is a blessing to serve. And, and something Jesus does within us is, is that love that he puts in us shows in very tangible ways because it turns us into servants. We become servants. And the older I get, the more I realize all the things God has given me, my time, my money, my energy, all that, when, if I can funnel that into serving people around me, I'm going to make a mark on this world that will last. And you will too. That's why it's a legacy, not of success, not of significance, but a legacy of service. Right now, literally right now, there's a funeral going on down at Dovewit Mortuary. 
And some of you read on the news or heard the, the story the other day of a young woman who was killed in a car accident. A young person drove through a stop sign, T-boned their vehicle, and she was killed on impact. And this young woman was due to get married this summer. And she has a little girl, I think that's seven years old. There's a family in our church who's very close to her. In fact, the, the girl, the daughter of this family in the church, was a bridesmaid to be in this wedding. And the man, some of you know Tom Downing. Tom Downing is the, her father, and he was asked to speak at the funeral. So today, he said, there are a lot of people who don't know the Lord at this funeral. He called me yesterday and says, give me some advice what to say. And uh, so we talked through the whole process, and I said, you know what, God has positioned you in a very unique place to speak something worthwhile into people's lives that probably would not hear it from anybody else. And God has positioned you to serve the people around you in a way that will make an impression on them that possibly nobody else could ever make. Leave a legacy of service. These all fit together, because when Jesus is Lord, we listen to what he says, and we get into his word, because I want to know what my Lord says, and what my Lord says always drives me to love better, to be a better lover, and when I love, it just naturally shows itself in being a servant of others. And so I want to talk to you, as we close here, just about your relationship with Jesus. Is he Lord of your life? Kyle Eidelman who's a pastor and author, wrote a book called Not a Fan that many of you have, you have read. And he says that oftentimes we cheapen the call to surrender to Jesus as Lord because we want Jesus to be likable. We want Jesus to come across as non-offensive, non-demanding. But he says we really do a disservice to them. And it's really dishonoring to the Lord because he, he compared it to his daughter who was in her 20s. He said, what if, I, what if I put an advertisement out there for someone to marry my daughter? What would I, what would I say about that? How would I present this offer to someone? And he says this, he says, I would set the standard high. I would do background checks and lie detector tests. There would be lengthy uh, applications that must be filled out in triplicate. References would be checked and the hidden cameras installed. If you want to have a relationship with her, you better be prepared to give her the best of everything you have. I don't just want to hear you say you love her. I want to know that you are committed to her. I want to know that you would give your life to her. That's his daughter. And she doesn't have all authority, but Jesus does. And so I'm not going to soft sell Jesus and say, yeah, Je following Jesus is an easy thing. Following Jesus just makes everything smooth. What I want to tell you today is, is Jesus deserves your life because he is Lord. He made you for himself. And honestly, there's nothing more fulfilling in your life than when you fully surrender him. You can fight him throughout your life. You can even be a Christian who's constantly fighting with the Lord, pushing back on him. But the best way, the, 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 the most satisfying way to live is to say, speak to me, show me how to live, and I'm going to walk that route in faith.